I'm Danielle and I'm Creative Director at Bluefish Entertainments. Today I'm going to be talking to Chris Williams, or you may know him as the Flying Scotsman. We're going to be having a chat about his life and his career so far. He is a phenomenal vocalist and performer and he's travelled all over the world doing what he loves. He's now an award-winning cruise director for Carnival Cruise Lines. He has an extremely popular podcast and YouTube channel and so many exciting things coming up. Please welcome Mr. Chris Williams. Hi, Chris. Lovely Hi, Danielle. To meet you. How are you doing? I am very good. How are you during these crazy times? I'm actually really good, thank you. Yeah. I was thinking today, I was trying to work out when we first met and I think it was 2013. Does that sound about right? It, it was, yes, because I got with my now wife in 2012, end of 12, and we finished our first, so yeah, it would have been 13. Yeah, so um, for everyone listening and watching, um, Chris is married to one of my best friends, Kim, which is how we met, and you two met because you were working on Carnival Cruise Line. On a, on a cruise line, yeah, that was it, yeah. So I want to talk about Carnival, but before that, um, obviously in your introduction, I was saying about how much you do, you know, you, you're an amazing, phenomenal singer, you're a cruise director, comedian, you do everything. But can you tell us a little bit about how you actually started and, and got into entertainment? So what was your journey? Yeah, my, my journey was a, was, a, was a bit of a funny one because from a very young age, when I was a little boy, um, I was the face of a chocolate cookie company, well, chocolate biscuit company. Um, that was my that was my my door to fame. I was uh, five years old, and if you've ever heard of a company called Tunnocks, they make Tunnocks tea cakes and Tunnocks caramel wafers, and they're they're like like nationwide, like the UK has them. It's a bit like Iron Brew. It's everywhere now, and uh, basically, I was the face of this company where I would literally they would put chocolate on my face, and I would wear a little kilt, and I would sing all these little like Scottish folk songs for all the grannies. And that was my first kind of bit of fame. You know, I did that for like three, four years. Uh, and then of course, um, I went to high school, did high school, uh, was in all the musicals and the shows and played all the parts, you know, from from Oliver to, to Teen Angel in Greece and lots of kind of big stuff. But then I, my, my professional side is uh, I went to college uh, when I was um, 16, just coming up for 17 years of age. And uh, that was my, my first kind of professional stuff where I was doing plays and drama, acting and performance. Uh, but musicals is where I wanted to go. Um, I really wanted to go somewhere with musicals. But for my voice, it's very, um, it's, it's very specific musicals that I would be cast in. Because when I was 16, I thought, oh, I'm going to be in Les Mis. But that's never going to happen because I am not your typical Les Miserables singer. So my, my, my kind of sound is more uh, you know akin to we will rock you uh, american idiot jesus christ superstar it's that kind of high rock tenor voice uh, and basically that was it I, I then went on from there to get my first professional job working for open wide international and i was part of the production team and that was my first big big professional job and i uh, went on from there and did all that so i've heard you sing i know how amazing you are um, and I'm sure that's always been the case, but what was it like auditioning? Did you like walk straight into that job? Did you have to audition for a while? Do you like auditions? I, I, I'm one of those ones that I, I've never done a lot of auditions and, and it's not to say, oh, I've never auditioned, I get the job right away. It's just um, some jobs have literally kind of fell into my lap. Uh, the job with Thompson fell into the lap because my, one of my good friends, still to this day, the, the male singer that was supposed to be in their cast dropped out and he needed someone ASAP. So he literally phones me and says, hey, listen, um, I really, really want to, do you want to come to London and get a job uh, We're at Pineapple Studios? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, you know, 18, 19 years of age. I was like, let's do it. And that was it. So for that job, no, I didn't have to, but I have had to audition for like Carnival and cruise ships. And yeah, I do have a really, really funny audition story for Carnival, which is absolutely hilarious Let's because go. I didn't want to, I didn't, I went there with an ex-girlfriend at the time and she was auditioning for Carnival the day before 
and there was about 150 girls all vying for this maybe 10 or 20 jobs and it was just a cattle market i'll never forget it and i <laughs> the next day she was having a day out with the girls and i was having a day out with my my friend and basically we um we all went to london for the day and she went and did her thing and we did our thing and then we walked past pineapple and it was the boys auditions for carnival and literally i kid you not there must have been about like 10 boys in there wasn't busy at all like really quiet and i just i probably had maybe one or two drinks at the time like i was really like having a great day i was wearing shorts and t-shirt it was the summertime and i turned around to my friend and i just went let's go and audition for carnival we've got nothing else to do right now let's go do it and uh, i went in there and they said to me um do you have your headshots and your resume your cv and um, your music and i went oh no i've left it in the car i was lying and i went outside and we went to uh, hmv and i got backing tracks for two songs impossible dream by luther van dross and um roxanne by sting so two really kind of high powerful songs and uh, i then went to snappy snaps and got passport photos for my headshot and I, re I, I literally wrote out my resume by hand. And I went in line and the, the best part about it was at the bottom, I had to write how I heard about the audition. And I wrote from, a, and I just wrote at the bottom from my extremely hot girlfriend. That's what I wrote at the bottom. So when we're standing in line waiting to go in for this big audition, like you're what, there's boys like sweating and they're like, ma, 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 ma. They're all warming up. And I'm standing there in my shorts and t-shirt. And they've got all of our all of our CVs. And the woman who I know very well now, she leans out and she goes, Um, who here has a very extremely hot girlfriend? And I just pop my face and go, Hi there, that's me. How are you? So I kinda already kind of made my mark by standing out. And I walked in and the 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 man that was doing it, his name is Ray, he literally looked at my resume and the the the, the passport photo and thought this is a wind up. And I thought on the spot, I need to think of something to say. So I just said, oh, I'm really sorry. It's not my good side. The two people at the side of him like did that laugh, but he didn't laugh at all. And he just went, okay, sing your songs. And uh, I sang my songs in the moment I opened my voice and this big, big note comes out. Like it was that kind of Hollywood moment where everybody at the table just all looks at each other and goes, what? And within about five minutes, he became my best friend. Like he was walking me up and down the room, seeing if I can dance, seeing if I can step ball change and paddleboard and all that nonsense. And I'm, I'm not a dancer. And literally there and then, that moment, they offered me a job to start in one week in South Carolina to literally go and join a ship. That is the plot <laughs> of a Hollywood movie. That is the Hollywood movie. <laughs> It was so wild and so crazy and broke up with a girlfriend over it because she didn't get the job and I did. And that was one of my things I said to them. I said, oh, I'm really sorry, but my girlfriend came here yesterday. And the exact words was, what was her name? I told her the name. And they said, oh, she didn't get picked. They're telling me this. And then they said, but I tell you what, if you accept the job, we'll put the two of you together and you can work together. So I come out the audition room so happy and I pick the phone and go, hey, baby, guess what? Me and you are going to join Carnival, and she was not happy because yeah. I thought, well, the reason she was trying to get a job on a ship is she was trying to break up with me, but I didn't know. Mm. So I then went, but guess what? I'm coming as well. <laughs> and that was it. That was my my nearly ten year career at the moment with Carnival. So obviously, you mentioned Carnival. So ten years you were a vocalist with Carnival. So I, I'm coming up to my ten year anniversary at the start of next year. And basically for um, five years uh, of that whole time, I was a vocalist and dancer, a playlist performer, and basically having to sing, dance, act, the full thing. So that was, uh, that's was that been that part of my job and now coming up to my five years as a cruise director. So for people that maybe haven't worked on cruise lines or haven't been on holiday, can you tell us a little bit about what a cruise director does? What's a typical day as a cruise ah, So the, the cruise director job is something that for me was something that I, I had done previously in a job before when I worked at Thompson's. I went on one of their ships to cover. Uh, they needed like a singer to go on there. And what happened was 
a, a role had opened up as assistant cruise director. And basically what it was, was looking after the entertainment team, making sure the schedules are done. But not only that, you're a performer as well. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Now, as a cruise director for Carnival, it's so, so different. And that's the reason I took the job in the first place was back in the old days, if you were on a cruise ship, your cruise director was the guy who would wear a tuxedo, stand and greet people to their tables and be the voice of the ship. And that was it. However, Carnival has changed all that. The, the cruise director role is now completely different because now 95% um, of the time is just me entertaining and 5% is looking after a team of maybe about five or six who are your fun squad. They're like your hosts who look after the trivias, the quizzes, but your job is to entertain. Now that's not just, you know, talking and, and be, being the kind of information guy. You're singing in shows, you do your own show, um, you're dancing at parties, you're meeting up with people, you're doing a bit of everything. And, and it's great because now I don't have to worry about that side of looking after like the schedules and the, the, the emails, because now in our position, we have someone who's called an entertainment director and a cruise director, and it's kind of like a partnership. So they look after the team of 35 people and all of the paperwork, whereas you are literally just entertaining guests and making sure that they have a great vacation. That sounds like a dream job. And it seems like you have so much fun, but I know from speaking to you and from speaking to Kim that the hours, like literally you're never not working, are you? So how, yeah. how do you find that? Like three months on is it constantly no days yeah off? it's it's so hugely four months i because now with my family i have four months on and two months off and basically i'm the kind of person though when i was in a cast when i was a singer and a dancer uh you for anyone who doesn't know you're you're basically maybe working three maybe four nights in a week but you're you're only working maybe like two and a half hours and all your days you're doing nothing and, and I'm the kind of person I need to be doing stuff. So I was always the kind of playlist performer that would always phone the cruise director and say, hey, do you need someone to be part of the game show tonight? Do you need someone for this? And they used to love me because like playlist performers and that kind of, you know, singers and dancers, we don't do that other stuff. But I was the kind of one that was like, I need to, I need to be creative. I need to do stuff uh, and it keeps my brain working. And for me, it's a big thing. But the job itself is, and I, I can't sugarcoat it to anybody who's thinking about being a cruise director, it is literally seven days a week and you're on call 24 hours. Because at any point, anything can happen. You're the first point of call, captain, then you, because you're the voice that people need to hear. But on a typical working day, you're working maybe 13, 14 hours a day. And it's full on. The moment you open your door, it's imagine being on stage in the West End, but being on stage for 14 hours. You can't ever switch off. You have to be on 24 seven and making sure that you're, you don't, you know, you can't have a bad day. If you have a bad day, you, you leave that in the cabin, you get it out and then you have to open that door and, and go out there. So positivity is massive um, if, you're, if you're ever becoming a, a cruise director. So massively mentally draining as well as physically. Yes. Um, so what, what kind of advice would you give anyone, not just if they're interested in being a cruise director, but going into entertainment, especially now with these difficult or different times, should we say, do you have any advice that maybe someone's given you or that you've found worked really well for your career that you want to pass on? Yeah, my, my biggest, the biggest advice is so, it's so cliche, but honestly, it's worked for me so much. Say yes to everything. Honestly, the, the reason I say that is now, especially with what's going on in the world, you know, people are struggling for everything. And sadly, we can't be picky. We can't, you know, pick and choose our moments and our jobs and our careers that way. We, we have to take what, what, what's there. And for me, I've, I've always been a yes guy to, to anything. And I'm always the kind of person that I always say to everybody, even my teams that I work with, try it. If it doesn't work, we'll never do it again. It's fine. But don't be defeated before you actually get to the main, you know, the main goal. So always be the yes guy. And then, of course, once you get to a point where you've done all that and then they ask you to do it again, then you can make your decision up and go, well, I've already done that. So maybe not at this time. But if something comes your way, a job opportunity, um, anything, always say yes. Always say yes. That's, that's always been my motto. That's a great piece of advice. And I think it goes with you. And as you were saying, that positivity that you have, just be open to everything. Try yes, it. Yes, always, always be the yes person. 
Um, a couple of things I do want to ask you about. So firstly, in, the, in my introduction for you, I mentioned that you are also known as a Flying Scotsman. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about how all that came about, the show that you do, the concept, your persona, all of that? How's, how did that come around? Yeah, it came about, I've always been known as Chris Williams, and when I was in cruise ships, I needed something, I needed a name that was going to stick out, and believe it or not, it was an old cruise director that I worked with many, many, many years ago, and I was about to go on stage, and he's like, I need to give you a little bit of an introduction, I don't know what to say, and I was like, well, just mention I'm Scottish, and I'm a little bit crazy because that's the whole thing about me. I'm high energy. So I'm jumping up on tables and singing and performing. I'm doing roly polies and, you know, all sorts. That's That was my trait. Not not so much now I've got to an age, but back then, God, I was swinging off bars and singing Freddie Mercury and that was my thing. And he went out stage and went, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. Um, he's going to be everywhere, flying around the room. Give it up for our very own Flying Scotsman. And, and from that moment, it clicked with me. And I'm like, oh my God, I love that. So I went back to home after that contract and I thought, I wonder if I can market myself. And I did some online searching. And then the best part, which just all gelled together, is the Flying Scotsman is actually a steam train, for anyone who doesn't know. It's a steam train in the UK that's been around for like 70, 80 years. And you can go on it to this day. And it's like a little train where you can get tea and cucumber sandwiches. And it goes from Edinburgh to London. And it's kind of like a day out. But the great thing about that train was the logo of that train back in the 1930s was literally said, the Flying Scotsman, the only train to be here, there, and everywhere. And I went, oh my God, it's like a sign from God. <laughs> it's like, it's just me, you know, high energy, here, there, everywhere. And, and then that was it. So I've been known now as the Flying Scotsman for nearly 12 years, 12, 13 years now. Wow, that's an amazing story. I never knew all of that. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> love that. And the other thing I really want to ask you about is um, on your YouTube channel, you have something called Bathroom Duets. Yes. Can you tell us all a little bit about that, please? <laughs> yes. So while I was on cruise ships and, you know, I, I did vlogging. for. I still do vlogging now and again, but my YouTube channel was my vlog channel. So I would do a lot of stuff behind the scenes, life of a cruise director. And people really enjoyed it because they got to see the stuff that you don't get to see. And then, of course, this pandemic hit and I was stuck on a ship during this crazy pandemic. And I was on a ship in my cabin my space for nearly 57 days. Um, not being able to go outside, not being able to see anybody. I was stuck inside this room. And for the first week, it was amazing because for a cruise director, it's a week off and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, you've just done a crazy week before. I'm getting a week to rest my voice, to, to recharge my batteries. But after that week, I was climbing the walls. It was mentally the most challenging thing I've ever done. And I had to think of new and creative ways to do stuff. And one night I was in the bath and I started singing. I just started singing at the top of my voice. And I was singing, um, believe it or not, I was singing Pavarotti's Ness and Dorma. And I'm wailing all these big notes out. And my next door neighbor, his name is Jack. He bangs the wall and goes, oh my God, sing another one. So we joked that I was singing in this bath to him. And he was trying to sing along with me at the same time. And we're in two different rooms. And then I just had this idea. And I was like, wouldn't it be great that if we get singers in a bathroom singing together. Because people always say, oh, I'm a good singer in the shower. You know, it's always that saying, oh, I sound great in the shower. Well, what if you actually put singers in bathrooms? What would it sound like? And then that was it. I reached out to lots of friends, a lot of colleagues. And then um, within about the first week, I got like five or six people who were like, definitely, let's do it. And then from then on, it took off. And then I was getting inundated with messages hey i'd love to do a bathroom duet um i've got a really cool bathroom it looks great and, and the acoustics are brilliant and you know what can we do together so yeah we we did a whole season one uh, i think we've done maybe like i think it was like 12 or 13 episodes um of bathroom duets and some of them are really good all different styles as well and the idea is whatever style they bring i have to match their style to to kind of, you know, it could be musical theater, it could be rock, it could be opera, it could be anything. That's where it all came from. And it, it was it was a nice little thing. 
Amazing. I'm sure you'll be inundated with more people already. <laughs> yeah. I do have one more question for you. So obviously it is a bit of a difficult time now. And luckily you're back home, you're with your mm -hmm. family, which is nice. Um, but, you know, have you got anything that motivates you or anybody that inspires you, that just keeps you going and, you know, that perhaps people would find interesting, TV, movies, anything that really sort of there's, I, th I think there's a couple of things like I've, I, the, the number, the, the, the things that I, that, that inspire me is music, of course. So I, I'm always looking for new and creative ways to do music. Um, I just did a duet with Brian May from Queen the other day, but not, it's really funny. It's people are now going crazy over it online. They're like, how did you phone up Brian May? I did some research, I, I, again, because my brain's thinking, I found a video of Brian playing Love of My Life and his during lockdown, sitting playing the whole song because it was him recording it for Kerry Ellis and he had done it. So I thought, what if I put him on one side, me on the other, as if he's playing it for me and I sing the duet with him. And we put it up yesterday and oh my God, it's blown up. How did you get Brian? Oh my God, I'm so happy for you. It's so, I don't know if it's hard to tell people, but like things like that keep me motivated, you know, just to be creative and do different stuff. Um, and just like anything like that when it comes to music is, is very important to me. But the number one person that, that kind of inspires me every single day, and it's going to sound cheesy, but it is my wife. And the reason I say that is because she is the most amazing person, like when it comes to being positive, when it comes to being supportive as well, like literally she has my back in everything that I do. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of bad choices in there, but she will still stand by them and then basically pick me up whenever they, they fall flat, you know, and she's always the, the main supporter. And the fact that she looks after her daughter as well. So like, she's definitely the, the, the number one for me. I love a quick fire round. Um, I love it. It's, I'm just going to throw questions at you. Let me know the answer that comes to your head. Okay. Yeah. I think I know the answer to this. Favorite okay. drink. Favorite drink. F favorite drink. Iron brew. Thought so. <laughs> um, summer or winter? Winter. Every time. Uh, favorite rainy day movie? Oh, it's got to be Alpha Papa with Alan Partridge. Great choice. Great choice. <laughs> um, Sweet or savory? Savory. Texting or talking? Talking. Can't text. Hate it. Um, favorite TV program? Ooh. Game of Thrones. Okay. Um, celebrity crush? Oh my goodness, there's loads. I'm sorry, Kim. Um, there's so many. I, I think my number one is, is still to this day. Oh, it's a, it's a, I'm going to say it, Charlize Theron. Great choice. Yeah. Uh, number one superhero. Oh, a uh, Batman. Oh. Hands down. Okay. And then finally, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? It's a choice, either flight or in invisibility. But I think flight. Because then I can fly up to Scotland and see mom and dad and be back in time for tea. So I I'd, I'd definitely say flight for me. Well, you are the flying Scotsman. Hey, uh, there we go. <laughs> Doom. Boom. Um, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure everyone's going to love learning a little bit more about you. So until we see each other in the flesh again, stay well and safe. Thank you. Thank so you so much, much, Danielle. Thank you. Stay Bye. safe, everybody. Bye. Bye.